My name's Colin Marshall. This is the Marketplace of Ideas. My guest is comic artist Peter Bagg, perhaps best known for his long-running alternative comic, Hate, which was embraced as the quintessential artistic expression of Gen X slackerdom. He's the subject of the first book in the comics introspective series from Tomorrow's Publishing, and a collection of his newest series, Apocalypse Nerd, comes out this month. Peter, welcome to the Marketplace of Ideas. Oh, thanks for having me. Now, I wanted to mention, start out with, rather, the first or the newest thing that I've seen from you, and that's the cover of Neil Pollock's Alternadad, the paperback release. And I was looking at that image, and I thought, that is, that's a perfect thing to have Peter Bagg illustrate. I'm not sure why I thought that, but what made that a good project for you to do? The art director from, the, from that book's publishing company obviously thought the same thing that you did, because it was all his idea. He just contacted me offered me the job, the job paid well, so I, I agreed to do it. It's got kind of a feel, though, like the, the nature of the project itself, with this guy living a bit of a desultory, unusual lifestyle who suddenly finds himself with responsibilities thrust onto him. That seems like it's a bit of a Peter Bag theme. Maybe I'm thinking of the end of hate more than anything else, but would, did that resonate with you at all? Sure. Well, it reminds me of, of uh, most of my friends who... Uh, most of the people I know, uh, especially creative types who live a rather extended adolescence, <laughs> or not adolescence, but youth, they never come across as people who are preparing themselves for parenthood until all, all of a sudden parenthood is upon them. And even when they're having a baby is completely planned, it still is always very hard to get your head around some alternative arty type becoming a parent. It's just like they have a hard adjustment too. My wife and I had we had a hard time really imagining ourselves being parents. We were never we were never completely sold on the idea. We just <laughs> at a certain age we just figured it's now or never, so we just went ahead and had a kid and no regrets. But that's what that book is. That that's the main thrust of the book too is somebody who uh, has this alternative weirdo identity who suddenly becomes a parent, and you want to be a good parent. You know, you don't want to drag your kid to rock shows or <laughs> weird <laughs> independent film festivals and things like that. So so it's an odd adjustment. And this is kind of what your main character of hate, Buddy Bradley, has put on to him at the end of the series, the same, a similar set of responsibilities. But I wanted to get a little bit into the genesis of hate for those who are listening and haven't actually read the comic. Now, tell me a little bit about the series from which... Hate Sprung, or I guess the sub-series, The Bradleys, and it, that was more of a, a whole family sort of deal. And what made you decide to try that? A, 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 not really a sitcom format, but a comic featuring a family. I started working with this one character named Buddy Bradley and the Bradley family going back quite a ways. I created them back in 1980, actually. And then when I got my own comic, my first comic book, it was a one-man anthology with so I was working with all different characters, and one of the characters was the Bradley family. And they always were somewhat based on my own family. It was a cross between, I originally presented them as as if it was a sitcom, as if here's the Brady Bunch, but only it was the Brady Bunch crossed with my family. So it had all the dysfunction and all the crazy stuff that happens in a real family. And it was very slapstick at first, and the humor was pretty surfacey, but uh, the more I worked with, especially this one character, Buddy Bradley, the more semi-autobiographical he became, and the story started getting deeper, until it reached the point where not just the Bradley family, but he was taking over my work. So then, by 1990, I decided to just give him his own comic book, and for some crazy reason, I called the comic book Hate, but the comic book pretty much it did just follow this one character. And I always had him age. I kept having him evolve and age. Uh, he always was roughly 10 years younger than me. The autobiographical work you could do with Buddy, was that the appeal that made him be the character that stuck out to you out of all the Bradleys, or was it... Yes, oh, yes, okay. definitely, because he was the 
son of the family. When I originally was doing the comic strip, he was he was a teenager, and the way he related to his parents was very similar to the problems that I had with my parents. Not just me, but like with all of my siblings when they were going through their teenage years. While I'm not exactly like the character, Buddy Bradley, I certainly relate to everything he does and says. I relate to all of his impulses. So, um, and then I also like the fact that uh, there always was this 10-year gap between me and him, which made it uh, very easy for me to have him age and evolve, if evolve's the right word. And I'd always think about, while I was working on a story or a set of stories with him, I'd always think about where I was at 10 years ago. So while his life doesn't isn't exactly like mine, it, it parallels it in many ways. How hard was it to write a version of yourself into a, a different cultural context? Because 10 years later, I mean, things change in terms of what someone that age is going to be be into. Right. Well, to me, nothing had changed. And in fact, oh. uh, the ironic thing was with, with Buddy, even though he was, like I said, he was 10 years younger than me, when I'd show him playing records or going to the record store, I'd had, I had him buying and playing the same exact records that I was listening to. I guess that's they would have so, done, wouldn't they? But again, you know, he just seemed like a, a kind of a retro kind of a guy. But nobody made an issue of it, you know, it, because an awful lot of the people reading the comic book felt the same way. They liked the music from an earlier era better than what was being put out at that time. Buddy is not perfectly a man of his time, and I think that's one of the appealing things about him. He maintains his outsider status in that way. Right. Now, at the end of the Bradleys, Buddy is in, I mean, fairly dire straits. He ends up literally a bum. Was that a point that you you just wrote him into, or were you yourself living his battle lifestyle toward the end of your I, high school career as he was? I never was totally homeless. At the same time, I had no money. I didn't have enough resources on my own for a while there to move out on my own. I was trying to save up to go to art school because my parents didn't. They were broke, too. So technically, I lived at home, but I spent as as little time as home at home as possible. I just couldn't stand it there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you know, so every now and then, I would just if if I could get away with it, I would just sleep sleep in in the car. I would just crash at people's houses all the time. I would sleep over a girlfriend's house. So uh, again, even though technically I had a home, I I stayed away from it as much as possible. So that was just showing Buddy in that situation. And again, it was very temporary, him just crashing in the um, out on the beach. And if I remember correctly, it was mainly, I don't think he was literally kicked out, it was mainly just him simply trying to avoid a confrontation with his parents, and also just being so fed up with all of his friends, that, uh, or them being fed up with him, that he just, just for that night, he just simply had nowhere else to stay. So he just crashed on the beach. And when you decided to launch buddy's own series hate how much did you know about how his life would go in the in the long run did you have any clear idea of where he would end up 10 issues from them tw from then 20 issues from then well when i first started it i didn't know exactly where it was going to go i might have just had one or two st stories in mind one or two issues in mind at first but but once all the all the principal characters were established it was pretty easy for me to start thinking in terms of story arcs, where certainly every 15 issues, but even every five issues, it's tended to all work together. There was always like a certain story curve, so while I would be working on, if I was working on issue, issue number six or seven, I pretty much had a very clear idea of what was going to happen in the next three issues. And I should emphasize, for people who are listening and don't necessarily read comics a whole lot, there's some perception, and maybe you find this, that People sometimes think that comic artists are making it up as they go along, but that is not something you do. Oh, you mean where you just sit down and start doodling? <laughs> <laughs> I think some, you know, I think some people envision that, though. Right? Yeah. Well, there's cartoonists that do that. They're called the amateurs. <laughs> um, almost everybody, once every cartoonist I know, attempts that at some point, and they might just as an exercise, they might try it again even after they've established themselves, just to see what would happen, to just sit down and start doodling away, or just doing something panel by panel. But um, there's very few artists that could get away with that on a regular basis, and I can't think of anybody that does it regularly. And as I understand it, you get full text outlines of a story 
all the dialogue down before you put pencil to paper. Right, exactly. Now, when did you know that hate was a hit? In my gut, I felt fairly optimistic about it, that it was going to do well, just simply because I felt very inspired to do it. This, this whole new, I was just very excited about this new format and the whole idea of it. Um, but I, but I knew for a fact once before the first issue even came out because um, my publisher got advance orders and they were a big leap over my old comic book. My original comic book was called Neat Stuff, and that was published by Fantagraphics, who also published Hate. So right off the bat, there was a big leap. And then the second issue, the advance orders were a lot higher than the first. And the first issue had been of Hate had been re- just the comic book itself had been reprinted four or five times. How did you feel about the the uh, slacker and sort of grunge associations that people had been putting together with hate in their mind? Because, of course, Buddy is a young guy who right. could be called a slacker, and it's set in Seattle, and so all those associations came to be hung on it. Now, what did you think about that? Um, well, I had mixed feelings about it. The only thing that would bother me to this day is the assumption that I was jumping on some bandwagon. Because the timing was very close, but while all of those elements existed that would later have those names and labels, Grunge, Gen X, Slacker, all of that business, uh, while the elements were there and people like that did exist, those terms did not exist yet and it wasn't a phenomenon. There weren't articles being written about it. It wasn't quite, wasn't really encapsulated yet at the time that it started doing hate. One year later, it was <laughs> like a year after I was doing working on this comic book. All of a sudden, all these terms did start appearing in the media, and and people who fit that description suddenly became very self conscious about it, in that they identified with it to various degrees. But they also, sadly, one thing that is uh, is very stereotypical of, or was stereotypical of Gen Xers is this resistance to being labeled. Oh, they yes. hated that anybody was marketing anything towards them. They just reacted very negatively to that. So it became problematic for me because people who hadn't already started reading my comic book, they would hear it associated as part of this whole Gen X slacker thing. And one, they would assume that it, I was just trying to exploit that whole phenomenon. But the other two was this whole attitude of, don't pigeonhole me, man. So, <laughs> so uh, that would, it would be like the last thing they wanted to look at or touch I was see. anything they, that they perceived was being marketed towards them, that was created for them, like that somebody on Madison Avenue was guessing that they would like this. And, and if anything even smacked of that, they would make a point of hating it, of not to, touching it. And, of course, this isn't true of everybody, but, I, but for everybody that might have picked it did get a lot of publicity, but for every person that might have picked it up out of curiosity or because of the publicity, there had to have been an equal amount who didn't touch it. And I say that because my comic book was selling a certain level before all of that, the grunge business hit. And uh, the sales didn't go up at all. They, they still they stayed the same, basically. So you were you were ahead of the curve, but you yeah, ran the risk not of by much, looking but I behind. I most certainly was. <laughs> <laughs> and... So you still had a good-selling comic, though, even controlling for all of that right. backlash. So what do you think people respond to in hate? I mean, as the creator, maybe that's hard to respond to. But what do you think people... No, that's interest? very easy to answer. They just simply related to the character. Oh. E- even women are related to Buddy Bradley, just his reaction to everything. People would always say the way Buddy would respond to the situation or that person. They would tell me that it was they would respond in the same exact way. So that's why, I mean, that more than anything else is, is why people like the comic book. It's a buddy as, an, and as a bit of an everyman, then. Exactly. As far as comics in general, rather than just haze, when did you know that comics were the thing that you were going to do with life? Well, when I was young, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And it also was hard for me to imagine me becoming accomplished at anything, because I was very, I was a terrible student. I just was lazy and directionless. Didn't have much faith in myself to, to accomplish, to ever be accomplished at anything. You know, by the time I was out of high school, I, the one thing I knew is that I had to do something. 
And uh, so I made this effort just to, it was a big effort just to get into art school. And once I was in art school and sampled, well, you know, in your freshman year, they made you do photography, painting, everything. Uh, the only thing I, I realized, the only thing that I really enjoyed was comics. And the other thing, too, that uh, had a huge impact on me is while I was in art school, I came across old underground comics for the first time, especially Robert Crumb's comics. And I loved that format. Because prior to that, all I knew was Mad Magazine and, and regular mainstream comic books and and newspaper strips. And I just couldn't really, I couldn't see myself doing any of that. I was uh, not enthralled with any of those things by that point. But when I saw underground comics, and especially Robert Grum, Crumb's comic, it was exactly what I wanted to do. Just the format, the approach, it was perfect. So then it all came together. It was in... I remember it was my New Year's resolution of, of 1978 <laughs> that I was going to be a cartoonist, an underground cartoonist. I knew so little about the business, though, that I didn't know that undergrounds were basically dead <laughs> by then. I just figured all these... I thought their comics were so wonderful. I just figured that all of these underground cartoonists were rich. So that that was after the first underground boom, but yeah, the... which, you know, yeah, I was reading comics that came out in the late '60s and early '70s. It, it was a while before I realized that I rarely saw any underground comic where the copyright date was after 1973. What were the artists of underground comics doing during that dead period? Well, there were only a handful that were still making a living off of comics, and they were the better ones, besides Crum. Uh, Gilbert Shelton, who did The Freak Brothers, which was the one comic that did continue to sell well, not as well as it did in, in the heyday of underground comics, but from what I understand, they always sold well, and, and every issue was kept in print forever. And I, and he owned his own publishing company, Gilbert Shelton, so that helped him make even more money off of his comics than it, it would for somebody like myself who was looking for a publisher. And Crumb... It seemed like he would put out one comic a year, and he also was he had a band back then. He seemed to be as involved with his band, the Cheap Suit Serenaders, oh, yes. in the late 70s as he was with comics. And he was poor, but he didn't seem to mind being poor. He accepted being poor rather than doing stuff that he didn't want to do. And then uh, Bill Griffith, who did Zippy the Pinhead. He was still doing Zippy comics, and um, so he was still making a living as a cartoonist. But yeah, that was it. Everybody else, they would still do comics for the love of it, but uh, nobody else was making a living off of it. When did alternative slash underground, whatever you want to call them, comics come back? When was it the late 80s was, or early 90s? Yeah, or? no, it was the, um, well, the genesis of it was, you could almost pinpoint it to around 1980 or 81. Because it was around that time that countless cartoonists all over the country and all, and all over the world started self-publishing, either by simply making mini-comics and just going to Kinko's, or doing things in all different formats. Everybody was working in, in very different formats. And me and a group of friends of mine, we self-published a, a, a comic tabloid in New York City called Comical Funnies, and that started around 1980. And then something else that was a real focal point, or and became quickly became a focal point for what eventually became known as alternative comics, was Raw Magazine, Art Spiegelman's magazine. I don't know if you remember it, but it was a very slickly produced publication. It was oversized, and it, and it very much the idea behind it was to present comic art as art, art with a capital A. And he started publishing a lot of work by um, young up and coming cartoonists. So basically, all of a sudden, all these cartoonists, most of whom, you know, who I consider my, still consider my peers and who are my favorite cartoonists, they all came up around this time. And they all were self-publishing something in the early 80s. Eventually, you know, the better ones by the late 80s, they were, you know, they had publishers and they were making a living off of their art. But back then, everybody had to self-publish to get their work seen. This was a way then for comic artists to directly get their work out to an audience, and then they were able to capture that aud that audience's imagination in that way. Right, and the great thing too about um, self publishing is you pick your own format. You you and you answer to absolutely nobody. 
So what was very interesting about that wave of cartoonists that I came up with was there was a wide variety of styles. There, everybody had like a completely different approach in drawing style and writing style. Uh, it was like a huge barrier. That, like, I don't know if you know all of these artists, but the Hernandez brothers and Charles Burns oh, yes. and Gary Panter and Matt Groening, of course, you know, and, and Linda Barry. Everybody's drawing styles were completely different, you know, but, but, every, but we all liked each other's work. You know, we were all fascinated by each other's work, but we didn't quite, like, compared to now, where to me, to my eye, there's, this, there's a certain sameness to a lot of alternative comics. It sounds like there was camaraderie back then where there's a little more competitiveness now. Well, but, you know, there was competitive as in to back then where if somebody I'd been corresponding with suddenly or whose work I was familiar with put out a new comic book and that artist made a huge leap forward. The art, the storytelling was a lot better than their previous work. It would put a light of fire under my butt. I'd feel like, oh, I, this person is moving forward and I don't want to be perceived as staying the same because then people will lose interest. So it would inspire me to try to produce a better product. What can you point to in your body of work and say, that is when I found my voice? When did you become the Peter Bag people recognize immediately today? Because I was looking at some of your earliest stuff, and you can tell it's you if you read a lot of Peter Bag, which I do, but maybe a casual reader wouldn't necessarily know. Boy, I would say that it all came together with those early issues of hate. Oh. Because what I did with those early issues, especially not the first issue, the first issue is a bit awkward, but I would say starting with the second issue, what I did was I approached everything about it, the writing and the, and the drawing of it, very unselfconsciously. You know, it, 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 I, was, <laughs> I very consciously chose not to be self-conscious about it, if you know what I meant. I think I Prior to that, mean. I was always experimenting with exactly how I drew it. Like, will I use cross-hatching in this one? Will I use the zipatone, gray tunes in this one? Will I draw it very stylized? Will I try to make it look vaguely realistic? I kept all, all through neat stuff. I kept changing with every story. And somewhat, I was doing that somewhat on purpose. I wanted every short little story in, in neat stuff to look different. But with hate, since I knew it was just going to be, for the most part, one long story about one character, I just sat down and drew it in a way that just came natural. And, and I wound up putting in a lot of cross-hatching, partly because I wanted it to look like an old underground comic. I wanted it to look like an old Freak Brothers comic and have it printed on the cheapest newsprint, have, give it that old-fashioned, that old underground-y, gritty feel. I look at some of the older neat stuffs, and reading those stories, there's the feeling that absolutely anything you could draw could happen in the comic. There was no really no physical limitation on what the characters could do or be subject to. In a right. Lot of yeah, I was very in the and, and through most of the '80s, I was very inspired by artists like uh, Basil Wolverton and Big Daddy Roth in 1940s style animation, like Tex Avery and Bob Clampett and other Warner Brother cartoon animators, and I loved that very super-exaggerated Auga look, <laughs> and um, and I wouldn't nuts with that. Sometimes it, was, it wasn't, it um, was as the stories started getting a bit heavier, those incredibly exaggerated physical poses and facial expressions weren't always appropriate. I think I sometimes went a little overboard. <laughs> and you still see in the comics today, like the, the, the arms especially, that's kind of a bag trademark with the, the arms that bend every which way and stretch out. Right. And right. What, those you've retained those, but you took a turn toward realism as far as what could actually happen, the events of the story. Right. And it's something, that I don't think you've turned away from that realism. Even Apocalypse Nerd, all the events are. Yeah, I like, I like everything to be plausible. You know, it, not, not mundane, you know, I, I don't want to write about exclusively about everyday events, but I want to, everything in my stories to be plausible. I mean, there's exceptions. Like, I re for a while, I did a comic for the Weekly World News based on their Bat Boy character, and nothing that happened in that strip was the least <laughs> bit plausible. Oh, yes. It was all absurd. With my main work, yeah, I want I want it all to seem believable, just because it, it's it's more effective.
you know, it just makes for more interesting reading. I like having the reader relate to it, at least on some level. Do you ever get any readers say that they'd like you to revisit, say, the days of Girly Girl and Chucky Boy, where things were much wackier? I used to, you know, especially around the time that I stopped doing neat stuff. I would get that pretty regularly of people missing those former characters. At this point, hardly anybody even remembers those old characters. <laughs> so for that reason alone, I rarely get any requests to revive them. Now, about your, your actual working method when you sit down at the drafting table, in the comics introspective volume that just came out a couple months back, it describes a pretty labor-intensive process. And could you talk a little bit about that for those who maybe don't realize the work that goes into what you do? Well, first, as, as we already discussed, I... I write it all out in a script format. I use the same format that people use to, to to write movie or TV scripts. So I print that out, and then from that, I will do a rough. Also on, on typewriter paper, I just rough out the whole thing in a ballpoint pen just to work out all the breakdowns and whatnot. And, and then when I start to work on the final art, what I do first is I draw the whole thing on tracing paper. I pencil it on tracing paper. And then... I turn the tracing paper over, I flip it over, and I, and I look at it backwards. And then I draw it again backwards. And the reason I do that is because when I look at the work backwards, there's a lot of things that will be off, especially people's postures and certain things about the composition. And when I'm looking at it regularly, when, I'm looking, when I first draw it, I can tell that there's something wrong. There's always something a bit off, but I don't know how to fix it. You know, I, I can't quite diagnose the problem. But when I look at it backwards, I see everything that's wrong with it. I see it immediately. Every single, every little thing that is off kilter just jumps right out. It gives you a new and, perspective on it? Yes. And in fact, there's an old uh, art school trick, or it's, it's something that uh, artists used to, uh, that art teachers used to advise their students sometimes. For the same reason, is if there was anything off with their drawing, the composition or, or what have you, they would tell the students to hold the drawing up to a mirror. And it's the same thing. In the mirror, you're looking at the drawing backwards. And that's when you'll realize that your subject's head is all lopsided and things like that. And not just see it, but then you can see what exactly the problem is and how exactly to fix it. So doing this business with the tracing paper works that way for me. And, and there's other great things about working with the tracing paper, too, because then I take that tracing paper and I tape it to the, the final drawing paper the heavy Bristol board paper, and I rub, I, I transfer the pencil onto that. So I'll have like a soft pencil drawing there on the um, Bristol board. But while I'm doing that, I could still keep tweaking with the composition. Like in one panel, I might feel like the, the main figure's head is too high. So then all I have to do is take the tracing paper and slide it down on the Bristol paper. And, you know, whether it's like a half an inch or an eighth of an inch and and then transfer the drawing on there. So then it just gives me more of an opportunity to fix the composition. But then I have to pencil the thing all over again. Like I'll have a very soft transfer of the tracing paper pencil. Now I'm starting to get boring. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, I'm uh, following you. But I'll have, it, I'll have this very light penciling on the Bristol paper, but I have to pencil it again, all over again. Otherwise, that very soft transferred graphite, the, the, the pencil will just blow away, it'll smudge once I start inking it. So I have to very carefully pencil it all over again. Which, but again, that gives me more opportunities to make corrections and change things. And then, and then finally I start inking the thing. It sounds like a lot of the steps that are involved in this process, they go toward simply refining what you put down in the first place. It's, is the time you spend mostly refining of what you put down? Yeah, yes, the, the penciling is uh, the tough part. In fact, I spend so much time with this process that uh, by the time I start inking, this is something that I have to check myself on all the time, is by the time I actually start to do the inking, I tend, then I tend to go a little too fast. It's like I can't wait to be done. <laughs> you know, I, it, it, all the brain work goes into the penciling, so then I get a little bit lazy and a little impatient when I start inking, and I have to keep reminding myself to slow down, slow down when I'm, whenever I'm inking. You have to know not to go into autopilot. Right, right. And to, yeah, just fly through it just because by then I'm so sick of <laughs> what I've been penciling over and over. How long does it take you on the average to do a page of 
say, a hate-style comic? From beginning to end, about three days, if, if, if you include the writing. You're pretty tired of that page by the end of those three days, I would imagine. Yeah. No, oh, yeah, I know, there's some artists I know that spend a week on a page. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, but then there's ones that can do beautiful work in less than a day, and they're the ones I really envy. I was thinking about some of the themes of your work, and I was thinking mainly back to a story you did called In My Room about a, a, an aging hipster who turns down a friend's invitation to go watch Jane Mansfield videos so he can watch Teacher's Pet rerun on television while eating an old pizza crust. Right. And I was thinking, what is the appeal of middle-aged losers who are very savvy about pop culture to you? Because it's something that springs up occasionally, and both in hate, there's incidental characters like that, and it seems to be a, a thing for you. Right. Well, that, that comic that you mentioned in particular, it's based on all of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Well, not all of them, but an awful lot of them. Oh, dear. Yeah, I knew. That comic, I remember, it was a cross between two. They didn't even know each other, but it was a cross between two friends of mine. And I was young when I did that. I was like in my mid-20s when I drew that comic. And it was based on two older friends of mine. How did you know it was time to depict them forever in the comic form? Well, it, well actually, I think it was this, is that um, I had a friend that that lived very much that way when I lived back in New York. And then when I moved out west to Seattle, I befriended somebody else who, um, well, personality-wise, they weren't identical. There was that same lifestyle, the same <laughs> habits that, you know, they've been bachelors too long. And then once I saw that parallel, I was able to see them as an archetype. And I said, I'm going to draw a comic based on, not totally based on either one of them, but just to use them as inspiration just to show that Clearly, there are a lot of people like this. I remember reading the comic about 13, 14 years ago, and I haven't read it again since, but it's it's just stuck with me, I guess. I realized inside that that was a, a very real type of person. Well, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and there's another one that from the same book that uh, has continued, I, I would say, to haunt me since then, but it's it's been an enjoyable haunting, and that was called The Reject. Right. which I believe was uh, in the intro to that book called A Masterpiece by Crumb. Am I correct on that? I can't remember, but if that's what he said, he'd be correct. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, w I wanted to ask a little bit about the origins of that story, because for those who haven't read it, and maybe that a few, a few listeners haven't, it's about a perspective on one of those kids you meet in school, one of those kids who's kind of sickly, kind of weird, maybe foreign, eats weird stuff, has an odd family, and who becomes to the narrator, or I forget if it was the narrator or not, but one of those combinations of friend, antagonist, and sort of object of pity that you only really get at that young age. And how how did you come up with this story? Again, that was based on um, my own youth. To some, some degree, I related to the narrator, although I like to think that I was never quite as mean <laughs> as, as that kid was. <laughs> But that kid, too, he was like stuck between more bullying types of kids who he wanted to be friends with and, and wanted the respect of. And the bullying kids would really pick on the sad sack kid. So he would kind of go along with the bully when picking on, on, on the title character, which was the reject kid. And the reject himself, again, he was a, a cross between two kids I knew from my youth. Both and both of them were from Germany. They were both born in Germany, so and and had funny names, funny German names. So for that reason alone, they stuck out. But uh, they also were both of them were odd ducks for different reasons. One was was rather sickly, and the other was just a, a freak. <laughs> that was the same position where you kind of didn't know how to approach these kids, like didn't know how to what attitude to carry toward them. Yeah, or, or just simply, you know, that was back in the days when kids were just uh, hung out outside all the time. I'm 50 years old, and when I was a little kid, you know, our moms would just open up the front door and kick us out. And we, you know, weather permitting, we spent all day outside and just dealt with other kids. It was just rambling around or whatever kids happened to be around that we hung out with. And this one kid in particular, uh, one of the prototypes, he just kept following me and my friend around. He was lonely. He didn't have any siblings, and he just saw us, and he would just follow us around. But uh, because he had such a unsavory personality, 
we couldn't help but be mean to him. We we'd be amused by him, and we didn't want to be mean to him. But he was just such a mess <laughs> that sometimes we would just tell him to go to hell or do mean things to him just to make him go away. The reject captures an element of of childhood that I've found no other story really has. And you said earlier that that Crumb would be right when he called it a masterpiece. Is that one of the stories you're proudest of? Yes. And that story was a, a gigantic leap forward for me because prior to that, a lot of what I, was, what I was doing wasn't particularly deep. I didn't do it. I was like, at that time, I think that was the longest story I had ever done, even though it was only eight pages. The subject matter was far more serious than anything I had done previously. What I was doing before then was much more just for laughs and, and much more slapstick. But I was trying very hard to get my work published in in a publication called Weirdo, which was Robert Crumb's magazine. He did in 1981. He started in a comic anthology called Weirdo. And he ran a few things by me, but an awful lot of what I sent him, he just thought that they were a bit... He, he wanted something a bit more personal, or a lot more personal, let me put it that way. So I had this one idea of the reject, and I was a little nervous about it. I hadn't done anything like it before, so I was nervous about doing a story like that, of basically investing that much time in something and then having it poorly received or just coming out badly. But I did it anyway, just held my nose and dived in, and uh, and Crumb loved it. Around that time, though, Crumb had asked me to be the managing editor of Weirdo. I don't know if, if the reject was part of what made him decide to do that or not. It might have. So, uh, it, so that like so that was a groundbreaking strip for me on a number of levels. The position of the managing editor of Weirdo was, as I understand it, not the easiest thing you've ever done. No. Well, for one thing, it paid horribly. You know, it wasn't a living wage at all. It was just a, a pittance. And um, and yet, at the same time. The artists submitting their work, being published in Weirdo meant everything to them. So we had to deal with all these very vulnerable people and with their fragile artistic egos. <laughs> and, uh, and people handled rejection very differently. So some people would say, okay, I'll try, I'll try again, I'll try harder, or I see your point, or maybe Weirdo isn't the place for me, but other people would just threaten to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, which I never anticipated, and I didn't have very thick skin, so I was like, what? <laughs> you know, I, had a, I had a hard time with that. Even that gatekeeper position could not have been worth the death threats. Right. Yeah, there was just, it's like, I'm not getting paid enough for this. I'm really getting paid anything, and I'm putting up with all this crap. But um, it was worth it. You know, I'm glad that I did it. I, did, I had that position for about three or four years and, and learned a lot. And it was great to work with Robert Crumb, you know, but big artistic hero, and uh, he was wonderful to work with. I want to move it up to the work you've got coming out in book form this month, Apocalypse Nerd. From what I understand, it's based on this datum you picked up that North Korea could potentially get the range to nuke Seattle, and how did you know to make a story, or how did you decide, rather, to make a story out of that? One was I had, I had to come up with some kind of story idea because I had met with the publisher of Apocalypse Nerd. This is before I even knew that I was going to do anything with him. He agreed to publish um, a miniseries by me. I just had to come up with an idea. <laughs> and I had some vague ideas, and that was one of them. And it was just the vaguest notion. But uh, him and, and my editor there at that publishing company called Dark Horse, that's the name of the company, they liked the idea. And then that, so it's, from that point on, I just had to develop it you know, into a a graphic novel, basically, that was in, at least in serialized form last the last couple of years. But, um, yeah, that was what the impetus for the story was. Was It was back around the same time that um, the Bush administration were beating the drums to go to war with Iraq, at, at, you, know, you know, which turned out to be all for false reasons. Just as an aside, it drives me crazy that so many people, especially politicians, but that so many people said, I didn't know, you know, the president lied to us. How was I supposed to know that this was a bunch of crap? I knew it was a bunch of crap. I knew for a fact it was a bunch of crap. 
and and so did there was always a good twenty percent of the people that weren't buying it. So this like especially politicians, you know, have, who have access to all the information. For them to say they're not that they didn't know, I just find that's BS. To me, it's like it's just what they wanted to believe. It wasn't enough to blow up some caves in Afghanistan. The country, the average American, really wanted to kick somebody's ass. They wanted to see a conventional, not only a conventional war, you know, with tanks rolling, but they also wanted to see us totally kick somebody's ass. And the president took advantage of that mood by <laughs> and, and and successfully invaded Iraq with little resistance. And nobody, that's just it, nobody cared about the facts. They just wanted to kick ass. But uh, that being said, at the time that he was, you know, presenting the country with all these lies about uh, why we should go to war with Iraq, at that same time, I heard, on I was listening to the, a radio station, probably NPR, and the story was repeated more than once, where an ambassador or somebody, somebody who worked for the North Korean government, some big official, said that North Korea now had the capacity to nuke Seattle. And they meant, and I live in Seattle, and they obviously they meant Seattle meaning from North Korea, that's the closest place geographically, you know, in the, in the lower 48 yeah. states. So they just want to let us know that we can attack you on your own soil. And the government and most of the mainstream media, they completely ignored this. And I found it very ironic because here we are about to launch this huge war, huge expensive war based on lies, based on the fact that we think some guy has a handful of chemical weapons that he might theoretically use against Americans, which was not true. There was no... And there was absolutely no basis, in fact, to believe that, except everybody wanted to believe it. So we're going to war based on this bull****. And even though, this, sorry for my language, That's okay. but I even can, in North, that. but meanwhile, even though North Korea might have been BSing as well about their nuclear capability, here they made a, an overt threat. So we're going to war on a perceived threat, an imaginary threat, because Saddam Hussein never openly threatened the United States. And here, at the same exact time, another country made an overt threat, and no, nothing was done about it. Absolutely nothing. Nobody said anything. You're thinking go after the, the real or danger here. Well, I didn't want to go to war with North Korea either. You know, I figured that... If you that, had to go to one, you'd rather... Right, and just because they have the capability to nuke us, even if what he said was true, never in a million years would I think they would do it. But it still made me... It gave me pause to think, the leader of North Korea is not all there. <laughs> no, so it made me think, well, who knows? Maybe he did. And he mentioned the, the, they mentioned the city that I'm sitting in. You know, so of course, it, <laughs> you know, it got my brain spinning. Like, what if? So those what ifs evolved into the story in Apocalypse Nerd in which Seattle does get nuked. And this nebbishy guy who happened to be camping in the woods at the time suddenly has to figure out how to survive way out in the woods. And this is a scenario that had lingered in your mind before, like what, what would a nerd or somebody very acclimated to modern society do if modern society were stripped from him? Right. And normally when, when thoughts like that would cross my mind, it would be in terms of a fantasy, like a, a fantasy that I always like to have is, what if suddenly you're in some town or some city, your hometown, and you're like the only person alive? You know, you're the only person alive. And, but the reason I'd like to imagine that is just the idea of being able to wander wherever you wanted to, <laughs> stroll into any building, hop into a car or a boat and putz around in it, just to having complete and total freedom. But that's a, that's a pure fantasy. It's not based on reality at all. When I would fantasize this, I'd never be thinking about rotting corpses or, <laughs> you know, or that I might be dis whatever killed everybody could kill me in an instant as well. Because that's no fun. But, uh, but rather than thinking in those terms, when I decided to do a story about it, I forced myself to think very realistically. I tried to very realistically put myself in that situation and what it would be like. And just, just, just the day-to-day -day physical discomfort you know, of eating the same awful garbage every day or not finding food for a day and just uh, you know, having to generate your own heat it, when you have absolutely no... Backwood survival skills at all.
Just one gigantic pain in the butt after another. To, Bill will basic more than a pain in the butt. Oh, yeah. A nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yes, I understated the case, I admit. Right. <laughs> Just always on the one one step away from suicide is <laughs> how, how I had the character living his life through most of the book. Yeah, he's not Grizzly Adams by any means. Right. Yeah, but that's just it. Who is? Yeah, you exactly. <laughs> I remember a comic you did where um, Buddy Bradley was sitting around with some of his friends, and they were just kind of BSing about how they'd like to go back to the land, live in a cabin, and then the, their needs mount up to where they would need a jeep, they would need a rifle, they would need right. a generator, they'd need a jacuzzi. Right. At first, it was they needed nothing, and then it just kept yeah, it kept building up and building up. That's what I thought of when I first read the Apocalypse Nerd was well. The, here's this theme come back in in a big way. Right. You did a, a whole number on uh, an, an anti-war, an anti-Bush bit there, and this is public radio, so that's always welcome, but you're actually a libertarian. You're not, you're not left as, um, as I can tell you, public radio very often is. Now, you do libertarian comics for the magazine Reason, and how did that come about? Well, first, I, I was writing essays. I was writing illustrated essays for a website called suck.com, and which... No longer, we could still go to it. Everything is archived, but it, it, they're no longer producing new content. And this was back in the. I started writing for them maybe 1999, I think, to 2000. And even though that publication didn't have a specific political agenda, an awful lot of the people that wrote for it were libertarians and also were staffers or contributors for Reason Magazine, which, as you said, is very overtly libertarian-leaning publication. So when Suck folded, Suck.com folded, the managing editor of Reason Magazine asked me if I would pretty much con continue doing the same thing I did for Suck for them. Only we both agreed that rather than write essays, that I do actual comic strips. So it was like, it was like cartoon journalism they had me do. And I wanted to ask you what it's like to be a libertarian comic artist. And because I, I am a moderate and I'm on public radio, so that makes me seen as like far, far right around here. So right. what is yeah, it? Yeah, I know everything's relative. Yeah, what is it like in the field of comic artists? I, a lot of the comic artists I meet are left, and so I don't know if that's the context you found yourself in or not. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and there's some exceptions. Well, first of all, it's not a problem, especially in social situations, because socially, um, um, I lean very left. Yeah, me too. Um, it's just when it comes to when it comes to the subject of how to fix society's problems. Oh yes. My feeling is that uh, the last course to take is to turn to government. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, the place where you want to go very last. Yeah, where with all of my friends, it's just, oh, well, not just the government, but the federal government. It's, they just feel like the federal government should solve every problem, you know, that it all should go to them. It, it, it flabbergasts me that uh, it was the same exact federal government that started a war in Iraq, but they want those same exact people to take care of all of our wants and needs, which to me is just, it, it's a, it's just a horrible idea on countless levels. And I'm not an ideologue. Like, I'm not anti-government. We definitely need government, but I just feel that their role in our lives should be much, much smaller. And I'm very pragmatic about it, too. It's just, it basically comes down to being against and voting against every new piece of legislation that makes more things against the law, that regulates more things. That's basically all of what it always comes down to as well with the more government power we give them, it always means that there are more th there are more things that you could be doing that is now a crime. We're criminalizing everything. You know, where you can smoke, all of a sudden you're a criminal. To me, that's, like, that's something that uh, could have been handled socially, that you didn't need the hammer of the government. You didn't need the threat of fines and imprisonment. I mean, it's a quicker way to get to your goal. But for one thing, not everybody shares your goal. And there's just were countless ways that these problems could be solved without taking what, to me, is a very drastic measure. You know, if anybody tries to challenge it, you know, the, the consequences are drastic. Yeah. And nobody ever thinks about that. They don't think about the consequences. They just want that quick fix. And 
when you have the power of government, and the government has the power to take away your property and your freedom and even your life, when you're giving that power to the government, the consequences are huge, and we are basically are constantly giving away our real freedom in the real sense of the word. The average person, even people who are conservative, especially these days, ever since 9-11, Almost everybody has become very socialistic, and almost everybody believes in big government on the right and the left. So I don't, you know. So when it comes to the role of government these days, I'm in complete disagreement with almost everybody I meet. Everybody is completely willing to sacrifice their freedom for security. They want security, no matter what side they're on. Right, right. They're so afraid of uncertainty that they're willing to sacrifice. Well, that's just it. It, it doesn't. It it. it it's it's chipped away, but our freedoms have been getting chipped away at a faster rate over the last six or so years than I've ever seen before. Now, moving on a little bit from the large-scale loss of freedom, do you think this is a, a good time to be a comic artist? Yes, there, there seems to be, um, not only do the, does there seem to be more comic artists than ever before, but there's a wider variety there's so many ways to have your work published, and especially now with the Internet. If I was starting up now, I definitely would do a webcomic because there's no overhead other than buying a computer and a scanner. You don't have to deal with publishers, distributors, retailers. You just do it all yourself, and you eliminate all the middlemen. But how to make money is, is a bit tricky, especially since a lot of these cartoonists don't charge anybody to, to read their work online, but they actually wind up figuring out ways to make a living, and some wind up making a good living off of it. So that's definitely the way to go. And it's great. It's very accessible and easy. So f for that reason, well, that's one of the many reasons why this is a great time to be a cartoonist. Plus, you know, just the wide world of alternative comics. And even though I have mixed feelings about it, uh, it's also good that Comics more than ever are accepted as a legitimate art form. You know, it's not just looked at. I, I'm a bit nostalgic for the days when comics were thoroughly disreputable <laughs> and not a, at all a respectable way to make a living. And the reason for that is because back then we were all flying completely below the radar, and we just had nothing to lose. We had no prestige to lose. It, it felt a bit more liberating back then that you could just do anything, and uh, and who cared. I like to think that I I still have that freewheeling spirit, but that's my problem with a lot of alternative comics these days. Is it, it, it again it just seems to me that these young younger cartoonists are a lot more self conscious than I was. You can tell that they're thinking about getting good reviews and possibly getting a grant or a teaching job. And by doing that you have to do your work has to be important. You have to look and your work has to look and smell like you're you take your craft seriously. That you're not just simply indulging yourself. And in self indulgence can produce a lot of crap, but it could also produce great work. You know, it could be invigorating and, and you rarely see that anymore. Everybody's being very studious in the way they approach their work. You think the thrill of societal transgression in making or reading comics has been lost? Um, yeah, it, it, has, it has an academic feel to it now, now that it is respectable. And it's the same exact thing that happened to uh, jazz and poetry. You know, it becomes the realm of uh, academia. And all of a sudden, it, it's formalized. Everything about it becomes formalized. And you don't make money off of those producing those forms of art simply by producing something and hoping that the average Joe will like it and enough of them will buy it that you're suddenly making money, whereas if the average schmuck doesn't like it, you don't. Now you're trying to appeal to a certain group of people. You're trying to appeal to intellectuals. You know, you're trying to appeal to snobs. And it shows. Like once jazz became respectable which and it became the realm of the snob, which started happening in the 50s, like the early 50s, the nature of the music... And, and and the demographics of people listening to it completely changed. Prior to World War II, jazz and pop music meant the same thing. They were the same thing. You know, and they were disreputable, but... And again, I'm thinking personally, I liked jazz music when it was pop music. 
yeah. and I don't like modern jazz. You know, then it then it just became very just too generally speaking. I'm I'm totally generalizing here, but just too introspective, and you're just appealing to a certain group of people, a certain class of people. But that's that's where the money is. That's how you benefit. You want to appeal to academics and intellectuals. And and the people that you're trying to appeal to, the last thing they want is for you to produce work that that their plumber would also want to listen to or read <laughs> or look at. You know, they, they want to be separated from the unwashed masses. So the less accessible your work is, the more they like it. So you keep making weirder and more obscure esoteric art and music and writing just to appeal to these certain people because they're rewarding you with, you're not going to get rich, but you can make a comfortable living. You know what I mean? By performing at universities exactly. and at these, you know, you're just not performing in um, San Bernardino, but you're playing in <laughs> Copenhagen a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish we had more time, but alas, we're over time. So Peter Bag, thank you so much for coming on the Marketplace of Ideas. Yeah, thanks for having me. Our music is composed by Ben Althaus. Check out his website, Ben Althaus, that's B E N A L T H O U S E dot com. For more information and our online show archive, visit Colin Marshall Radio dot com. <laughs>